In mid-April I first wrote about how Zimbabwe took delivery of a Boeing 777, which used to fly for Malaysia Airlines. Zimbabwe's government-owned airline is US$300 million United States dollars in debt, so Zimbabwe did what any rational government would do, and planned to acquire four 777s that they'd lease to a startup airline. This doesn't come as any surprise, but there has been a lot of scandal surrounding this. Scandal, scandal, scandal The first bit of scandal revolves around the Mugabe family. The government claimed that this airline had absolutely nothing to do with Mugabe. That's despite the fact that Mugabe's son-in-law was one of the captains of the plane when they took delivery of it, and that Mugabe's daughter met him when the plane arrived, and that the plane's registration code is ZRGM, with RGM presumably standing for Robert Gabriel Mugabe. That's only half of the scandal. It then came out that allegedly 140 million United States dollars couldn't be accounted for in this deal. That happens to me as well sometimes. You know, when you drop 41 million United States dollars on something, and then 140 million United States dollars goes missing. You've just gotta roll with the punches in life, you know? I've been closely following Zimbabwe Airways, mainly because I've really been hoping to get on their inaugural flight. Could you imagine the fun destinations they'll fly to? Perhaps Grace, Gucci, Mugabe could handpick her favorite shopping destinations and they could build the route network based on that. Having had the privilege of already flying on a plane with Ms. Gucci, I'd love to fly with her again. It has been nearly six weeks since Zimbabwe Airways took delivery of their 777, and based on flight trackers I've been monitoring, the plane hasn't moved. It's still sitting at Harare Airport in Zimbabwe. So, what's going on here? The government of Zimbabwe is more involved than they claimed. The first interesting update here is that the government of Zimbabwe initially claimed that they weren't involved with the new airline. That's to say that they were responsible for the lease but a private company would be operating the airline, and presumably would be paying lease payments to the government. They've now admitted that's not the case. According to The Economist, the government had claimed for months that the new airline was a private initiative, funded by Zimbabwean investors living abroad. From Gumbo, the transport minister, told local newspapers it had been necessary to lie because, if they had been exposed as government of Zimbabwe planes, they would have been taken by the creditors who were claiming for money. He also revealed that, the man in charge of Zimbabwe Airways, is Mr. Mugabe's son-in-law. So what happens now that it has been revealed? Air Zimbabwe isn't letting Zimbabwe Airways park their plane in hangar It actually seems like this is quite reasonable, but there's also apparently some controversy because Air Zimbabwe isn't letting Zimbabwe Airways this their hangar for the 777. Instead, the plane is parked at the domestic terminal at Robert Mugabe International Airport. According to Zima.net, the sources who spoke to Weekend Media said that, the Air Zimbabwe hangars do not meet the standards required by the insurance companies for the plane of which the airline cannot take the risk to accommodate the aircraft. The Air Zimbabwe hangar which was commissioned during Zimbabwe Rhodesia era does not meet international standards for risk cover. It does not have smoke or fire detection system. It does not have a fire suppression system, automatic sealing water, foam sprinklers. The other smaller hangar has been housing Air Zim's B737 which has been on major maintenance for more than four years now, the source said. So yeah, it doesn't seem that unreasonable for them to not want to accommodate a plane when the facility isn't equipped to do so, then again I'm not sure what exactly the facility is equipped to do, given that an Air Zimbabwe 737 has been in maintenance for more than four years. Bottom line just wow.
I don't think anyone in their right mind thought that the government of Zimbabwe was ever serious about this, though it's especially sad that it looks like this may have just been a deal to make 140 million United States dollars miraculously go missing. This money could have been better spent on the people of Zimbabwe. I think it goes without saying that Zimbabwe Airways won't be flying their 777 anytime soon, though I do wonder what will happen with it. Will this plane just be parked at Robert Mugabe International Airport until it's completely unusable? Will they sell it to another company soon, or what? Page 2 a few days ago Ben wrote about some business class experiences he'd like to review. I've been just as fascinated by Condor's route from Frankfurt to the Yukon as he is, so I sent him a text asking, when are we going to Whitehorse, long story short, we're planning a trip. After. All, who could say nay to a place with a name like Whitehorse, Winking Face Canada's sparsely populated federal territories, Yukon, Northwest Territories and Nunavut, look beautiful, and I've always wanted to make my way up there. But I can't imagine going all the way to Whitehorse without flying on the city's hometown airline, Air North. Ever heard of it? They have a reputation for being an especially beloved airline. Their website may not have the unnecessary complexity bells and whistles of odd.com, but it has lots of personality. Their news section, for example, contains archives going back several years, including some adorable April Fool's releases, recent ones include announcing the acquisition of an A380 featuring a gambling hall of puppy pen, and hourly yoga classes, and promoting a new route from Whitehorse to Amritsar, India. They also have a YouTube channel, with videos that range from adorable to slightly cringeworthy. Their route network covers several cities in Western Canada, including 737 service to Vancouver, Calgary, and Edmonton. They even fly as far as Ottawa. But what I'm most interested in is their service within the Yukon, they fly to Old Crow, population 221, and to Dawson City, the second most populous municipality in the territory after Whitehorse, with about 1,400 people and about 25,000 people, respectively. By the way, one of Dawson's claims to fame is the Sour Toe Cocktail, served at its downtown hotel, a drink that contains a shot of whiskey and a mummified human toe. generally prefer my adult beverages when they don't contain actual adults, but to each his own. Flights to Dawson City on Air North are operated by a TR-42 turboprops and by Hawker Siddeley 748s. The HS-748 is a British turboprop that was produced from the early 1960s to the late 80s, and there aren't many still in commercial service Air North has a few, and many of the remaining examples also fly for small Canadian airlines. Air North HS-748 Photo credit, Ken Fielding, https colon slash slash www.flickr.com slash photos slash Ken Fielding Closing parenthesis I would absolutely love to try that white horse to Dawson City flight of 748. The only 748 I've flown on in the past was a Boeing 747-8, here's hoping we can fit it into our itinerary. Does anyone have experience with Air North, or are there any other towns in the Yukon that are must-sees? Page 3 For our last night 5 nights in the Seychelles, we visited Des Roches Island, where a brand new Four Seasons opened in March. The Seychelles consists of over 100 islands, though Mahé is by far the largest, and then there are a few more populated islands. The entire country has a population of under 100,000, and about 85% of those people live on Mahé. So, while a few more islands have populations of a few thousand, there are also some deserted islands, and one of those is Des Roches Island. The nearly 1,000-acre island has an interesting history and used to have a resort, though that was closed a few years ago and transformed into a Four Seasons, which just recently opened. 
What makes Des Roches Island especially interesting is that it's considered a separate territory for the purposes of the Traveler's Century Club, so I know that's a reason some people, including Rapid Travel Chai, have visited this resort. Des Roches Island is considered to be part of Zil El Wani and Cecil, Aldabra, Farquhar, Amiranti Islands. Booking flights to Des Roches Island Des Roches Island is about 150 miles southwest of Mahe Island, and while you could presumably somehow arrange a boat to get there, though it would be a long journey, the primary way guests get there is by flying. Here's a map showing the flight path, and here it is zoomed out. For some more context, there's a twice-daily flight between Mahe and Des Roches for resort guests, which operates with the following schedule Mahe. To Des Roches departing 10.30 a.m. arriving 11.10 a.m. Mahe to Des Roches departing 4 p.m. arriving 4.40 p.m. Des Roches to Mahe departing 11.30 a.m. arriving 12.10 p.m. Des Roches to Mahe departing 5 p.m. arriving 5.40 p.m. As you might expect, these flights aren't cheap. The cost varies based on the time of year you're traveling, prices are round trip, cost between March 1st and December 25th, 2018, 660 euros per adult, 580 euros per child, plus 15% VAT cost. Between December 26th, 2018, and January 15th, 2019, 720 euros per adult, 640 euros per child, plus 15% VAT. All of these flights are operated by an island's development company, IDC, Beechcraft 1900D. There is a single plane that operates this route, which is 22 years old and has the registration code S7DES, with the day standing for Des Roches Islands Airport Code, which is pretty cool. Well I'm by no means scared of flying, anymore, I'd like to research the airlines I fly, and it is a bit weird to fly an airline that has very little info out there. At least when you fly Maldivian or Trans Maldivian Airways in the Maldives, they operate a larger fleet, you can look up their history, etc. So, let's get to the actual, brief, review of the flights. Flying from Mahe to Des Roches Island we took the 10.30 a.m. flight from Mahe to Des Roches Island. We arrived at the airport shortly after 9 a.m., and as we got out of the car we were greeted by the Four Seasons Airport representative, Sonia, who would be helping us with the check-in process. She was an absolute delight, easily one of the best employees of the hotel we came across. While not related to anything, we were amazed by how easily she walked around in high heels, she explained that's all she has ever walked in, and she has an easier time walking in them than flat shoes. The main check-in hall at Mahe Airport is open air, though there's a separate check-in area for domestic flights. We turned left and walked towards the domestic terminal, which was just a short distance away. Sonia said that check-in wasn't quite open yet, but that she'd take care of the formalities for us, so we gave her our passports. She recommended we have a seat in the coffee club, which is right by the check-in area. There are no airport lounges in this area of the terminal. The people working in the coffee club had to be some of the rudest human beings I've come across in customer service anywhere in the world. It took us a minute to look at the menu, there was no one behind us, and the lady working the counter literally rolled her eyes and huffed. She didn't say a word to us the entire time. Not one. At around 10 a.m. the Four Seasons representative asked us to come to the check-in counter, which was located just a short walk away. At the Air Seychelles domestic counter there's a special Four Seasons sign. We were presented with handwritten boarding passes. We bid farewell to Sonia and were through security just a minute later, and there were a couple of dozen people sitting in the departures area. Almost everyone was traveling on Air Seychelles to Preslin, as they sometimes have multiple flights per hour. Air Seychelles has a fleet of five twin otters, and all five of them were on the ground parked there. 
that's not exactly great aircraft utilization, winking face the air Seychelles employee working the gate area was nearly as rude as the lady in the coffee shop. This is one of the things that disappointed me in the Seychelles. While some people were friendly, I was surprised by how many borderline rude locals I encountered. Just 15 minutes before departure our plane was still nowhere in sight, though finally it arrived at 10.20 am, I'm not sure where it was arriving from, as it was about to operate its first flight of the day-to-day -day Roches Island. Less than 5 minutes after the plane arrived we were invited to board. There was just one other passenger on the flight, a hotel employee, so we were escorted on the apron towards the plane. There we were greeted by the first officer, and invited to sit wherever we wanted. The plane had 16 seats in a 1-to-1 configuration. The Beechcraft 1900D is an odd plane from a passenger perspective, since it's so narrow yet the cabin is so tall. This one also smelled like a combination of fish and the ocean, or perhaps that's actually the same smell. The first officer gave us a quick safety briefing, and told us our flight time was 35 minutes, and cruising altitude was 17,000 feet. The life vests were within reach, as they were loosely placed in the seat back pockets. We began our taxi at 10.30 am, and were airborne a minute later. The views for the 35-minute flight were great, and we had a beautiful view of Mahe Island on our departure. The flight was smooth, and before we knew it we were on our descent to De Roches Island. We had some strong winds on our approach and were swaying side to side, but the touchdown was smooth. We taxied down to the end of the runway, where there's a small taxiway where the plane parks. This is right by the hotel's reception. As we pulled in, we were greeted by waves from nearly a dozen hotel employees. As an aviation geek I just have to emphasize how damn cool it is to have a runway right outside reception. Here's the view you get during check-in. One of my favorite features of the entire island is that you can run or bike up and down the runway anytime, except when the two daily flights are arriving and departing. Talk about bring it to the runway, runway, run, 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 runway, I apologize to the 90% of people reading this who have no clue what I'm talking about. Flying from De Roches Island to Mahe obviously I'll cover the actual resort stay in the next installment, but in the meantime I wanted to quickly write up the return flight as well. We took the afternoon flight given that we were taking a red-eye to Istanbul, allowing us to spend the day at the resort. The plane arrived right on schedule, and shortly before 5 p.m. we boarded. This time the flight was a bit fuller, as there were 8 seats taken. Once again there was a safety briefing, then we back taxied the runway, and 2 minutes later we took off, as we witnessed the start of a beautiful sunset. As we climbed out we made a sharp turn, and below you can see most of De Roches Island, including the runway. Ford doesn't like small planes, personally I don't love 22-year-old Beechcraft 1900Ds being operated by companies I've never heard of either, and on this flight we hit some significant chop, as we were in the clouds most of the way. Ford was a bit scared, so I tried to comfort him. Fortunately we managed to stay distracted thanks to a very interesting lady sitting behind us. She visited De Roches Island for just one night, as she's a territory counter, who was trying to check this off the list. Her next stop, Mogadishu, Somalia. About 20 minutes after takeoff the ride got much smoother, and shortly thereafter we began our descent. A minute after landing we were at our parking position, where we got to walk next to a Qatar Airways A330, as well as several smaller Air Seychelles turboprops. 
Everyone else on the plane seemed to be terminating their travels in Mahe for the day, so we were the only ones greeted by a Four Seasons representative. To our surprise, he escorted us to the airport's VIP lounge like, not the lounge we had access to, but rather the separate private lounge with a dedicated security channel. I'll be reviewing that two installments from now, but it was an interesting experience. Bum line on flying to De Roches Island It's funny how many of the world's best resorts have to be reached in some not glamorous ways, but I guess that's the price of going somewhere remote. These flights were expensive, though in fairness they weren't anywhere close to full, so I'm guessing they took a loss on the outbound flight. All around I found the flight experience to be easy, and I was impressed that both flights ran exactly on time. Furthermore, the help from Four Seasons representatives at the airport on both arrival and departure was a nice touch. I would note that there's often weather in the Seychelles, so if that's something you're worried about be sure you leave plenty of time before your international flight because there is a risk of cancellations. A few days ago Ben wrote about some business class experiences he'd like to review. I've been just as fascinated by Condor's route from Frankfurt to the Yukon as he is, so I sent him a text asking, when are we going to Whitehorse, long story short. Continue reading, last summer, Minneapolis-based Sun Country Airlines announced that they were planning on undergoing a major transformation, aligning more closely with the business model of an ultra-low-cost carrier. For years the airline has been surprisingly full-service continue reading. This situation just got even cooler, and I have to share an update. Yesterday I wrote about my temptation to fly Azores Airlines to Praia, Cape Verde, via Ponta Delgada, in the Azores. $800 in business class for a routing like this? How could I not? Continue reading, obviously not all OMAAT posts are going to appeal to everyone, and that's totally fine. I know a good number of you love my random posts about airline routes that fascinate me, while others are bored as could be by them. This is one of those posts, so. Continue reading, early last year I briefly visited Brunei, and also flew Royal Brunei Airlines. They're a unique airline, in addition to operating some short-haul routes, they operate just three long-haul routes, from Melbourne to Bundesari Bogawin to Dubai to London. Continue reading, we were spending 8 days in the Seychelles, and when we booked this trip many months ago, we initially booked 5 nights at the Four Seasons de Roches Island, which was going to be the highlight of our trip. I'll talk more about that booking process. Continue reading, 